Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another Rackspace Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is Alan, and we are broadcasting live from the castle, Rackspace's headquarters here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I've got uh, Drew with me. Hello. Hey, good to have you here, Drew. Glad to be here. Uh, yeah, we're, we're live with episode number 101. Uh, I've been doing this for just over two years, and we've got a really cool show that we've been wanting to put together uh, for quite a while, actually, um, about CICD. Absolutely. Um, that's definitely one of the uh, big topics that has a lot of attention right now, and um, I think some people may be afraid of it, and other people may uh, feel like they're moving that direction, but we wanted to provide some clarity and some understanding around uh, the topic and share with some of our experts uh, what they've learned and what they can actually uh, shed light on. So that's why we're not the only people in this uh, hangout today. We've got some experts who ought to be able to shed quite a bit more light on the subject. That's right. We reached out to our uh, one of our DevOps teams and have two DevOps engineers with us. Uh, John and Martin, you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, you know, how long you've been a racker, what you do here? Both of you at the same time. Ex yeah. That's how we do it here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll go. John. Go, 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 John. I'm John Schwinghammer. I'm a DevOps engineer on our DevOps team. Um, I've been here about almost three years now. Um, I work alongside Martin. So. Martin, go for it. And uh, I'm Martin Smith, and I've been here for just under two years as well. Uh, work on the same team with John, and I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, we're excited to have you both. Definitely. Uh, Martin, I'm impressed with your studio there. You've got some uh, some audio foam set up already, so we're a little bit jealous. Well, when I when you work from home, you got to get rid of as much noise as possible. Understandable. I've, I've got kids, so I I know how the uh, volume can climb pretty quickly. Well, good. So we, we wanted to kind of just keep this at a somewhat higher level uh, while we discuss uh, what can be a pretty complex subject, but uh, we, we definitely can go a little bit deeper as it's needed. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention that anybody that's watching us live, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. So one way is through the question and answer application right here in Google+. Just go ahead and click on that Q&A icon, and it'll allow you to ask your question. We'll take a look at those and answer them as they come in. Uh, there's also a hashtag, which you can use, CloudQA. Just use that, and we'll go ahead and answer them uh, live as they come in through Twitter or uh, directly in the Google Plus stream. And then, again, uh, YouTube comments, I think we're picking those up as well. So uh, go ahead and hit us up on any of those, and we'll, we'll answer them as you go along. Well, there's actually quite a bit of news to cover. Um, a lot yeah. has happened over the last few weeks. And so housekeeping-wise, it'd be good to cover some of that. Um, yeah, we let's... launched a new seriously green data center in London. And so uh, a lot of news went out about that a month or so ago, but we actually are building environments in that data center uh, as of this week. Right. So uh, that's big news. Definitely check that out. Um, I know Object Rocket has really been the major uh, newsmaker over the last couple of weeks with uh, dedicated Mongo and then some other features being added to the Redis offering. Yeah, definitely. Uh, dedicated Mongo is huge, and I'm really excited to see what that's going to do for some of our customers, especially that have uh, you know compliance and security needs as well. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and drop some links to both of those stories in the uh, uh, show notes. Also going on right now in London, uh, Drew is super upset that he's here with us uh, and not hanging out uh, in Arsenal Stadium that yeah. actually solved. Not too long ago, uh, maybe an hour or so ago, Solve London wrapped up, and that is uh, being held at Emirates Stadium. And as a Gooner and a big fan of Arsenal, I would have loved to have been there to celebrate our FA Cup win. Uh, but nonetheless, I... I'm here, and I'm happy to be here. We're going to talk okay, about some good right, stuff, right. trying to take a, a positive spin on it. <laughs> That's good. What was the last one we had here? Is that it? Oh, uh, two big awards for Rackspace that just were announced this week. Uh, EMC and Microsoft both gave us uh, major 
Partner Awards uh, starting this week. So um, really big honors. It's our fifth time with the same honor from uh, Microsoft. So that's that's one of our uh, pride points here at Rackspace. So glad to see that again. All right. Well, I think that's the, the housekeeping that we need to Got those cover. done. Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of get into the subject of CICD. Um, we have adopted uh, a faster code velocity at Rackspace. It's been an important uh, development for us, and it allows us to have some, some real advantages that we didn't have earlier when it, you know, a sprint cycle might be every two weeks or month or two months uh, between a deployment. Um, and we've really been able to take advantage of that speed of deployment. And we've got some guys here with some serious experience around um, that approach. And so let's let's start by uh, kind of getting uh, both of your views on what, what does CICD really mean. Let's see. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll grab that one first. So, um, you know, for me, I think about, I've seen a lot of different definitions of both of those things, but if you, if you are familiar with the alphabet soup, it's continuous integration and continuous delivery. So um, different but related practices, uh, I would say for me, the definitions, uh, continuous integration is the idea that your developers merge code into trunk multiple times a day um, and get it tested. It's uh, the idea is you're really just kind of speeding up that life cycle of, of develop and test. And uh, I think the other key thing there is uh, that you have to have tests. You know, a lot of us are, are so far beyond or so far behind that, uh, that paradigm. There's still a lot of interest in li literally just things like test first development, test driven development. But uh, you got to have tests. You run them every time you check in code, you merge it into the trunk or master. Uh, and um, that process actually is sort of the first step towards continuous delivery, which is uh, doing the same thing with releasing your software. Uh, and it seems to be uh, co correlated with much more successful, high-performing organizations. That would well, be hearing, sort of my definition. <laughs> hearing the amount of times you said test in that uh, short little explanation is music to my ears. That's the... Um, the song I sing every single time we get on the show because no matter what you're doing without testing, you're just gambling. So um, I'm really glad to hear that as a big part of the approach that um, you use in at least defining and covering the subject from a high level. Uh, do you have anything to add, John? Anything that you would uh, be sure we don't miss in at least the high level definition conversation? I think Martin pretty much nailed it there, but um, one thing that's Integral to that still is code review, because um, you have tests and stuff like that. But as far as it actually being readable and maintainable by a human being, in the long term, it's important to pass the tests and pass that code review in that process as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as the, the conversation that needs to be had here from a business perspective, as far as the why you would go about uh, undertaking a uh, shift from whatever you're doing now to develop code to um, a faster velocity and be able to put um, code through tests and into production more quickly uh, is a conversation around um, the the benefit, the ROI on making that change. And you've mentioned already um, being able to put new features out um, and being able to squash bugs really quickly and, and iterate quickly that's really the, the key differentiator um, in a market. So let's say you're doing uh, one of the orbits type uh, uh, businesses where you're trying to compete for people's travel dollars. If you don't put features out very quickly or there's a bug that crops up and your competition is able to solve that issue more quickly or take advantage of some change in the market more quickly, they're going to be the ones that get the big benefit from making that change and being able to put code into play to, to leverage that for their users. And uh, sometimes uh, a bug is a small efficiency that you're able to uh, just iron out an issue so you don't need as many resources as early. That's a cost savings. Uh, maybe it's that feature like we mentioned and that grabs more market share, so that helps the bottom line. And, and maybe it's just uh, fixing a pain point. And, the more of those pain points you clear, the more loyalty you get from your uh, user base, 
And that becomes a big business uh, reason for taking on this undertaking. So I, it is work, and we're going to talk about some of that work, some of those first steps, and some of that process today. But I think it would be a disservice to have this conversation without framing it in the uh, in that business why, because it's really fun and nerdy, but the f nerdy guys get into the nuts and bolts, and uh, it's never really clearly framed as to what's the, the reason why. Why does this create an organization with uh, real advantages over their competition and able to maintain that uh, that advantage once they've established it? If you're um if you're looking for some hard facts there too uh, for the viewers, check out the. Um, 2014 State of DevOps report. There's some really nice facts if you want to show somebody, uh, you know, some of the some of the numbers behind being the high-performing organizations for CI and CD, and how they're like twice as likely to be more uh, exceed their profitability and things like that. There's some really good stats in there if you if you're trying to explain this to somebody with a business case. Yeah, we talked about um, Saul London being today. Uh, I was at Salt New York last month, and uh, Caleb Groom uh, gave a talk, talk about the way that we're approaching uh, Magento specifically with our um, our DevOps approach. And in that buildup, they were talking about e-commerce platforms being able to actually hit their targets and exceed those targets at a much higher rate if they're deploying code very quickly compared to their competition. So, yeah, there's a, there's actually a video of that talk that's on the, the website for that event. So you can go and see the whole thing and get some context around how this applies to e-commerce specifically. But um, that's absolutely right. There's a huge difference in a company that can make those quick changes um, as opposed to someone who's going to have to add that to a sprint cycle that's going to be um, a lot further in the future before we can take advantage of it. If, if that company's already using sprint cycles. I mean, they might just be throwing things out ad hoc and, and willy-nilly. And I think that having a framework is, is one of the big keys here is to have some way to actually, uh, you know, understand what's going on and, and know what's going to happen. And, and, and throwing those tests in there automatically helps as well to, to get things out and not break things as you go. I mean, it, it might be fun to say that your startup moves fast and breaks things, but uh, moving fast and not breaking things is pretty cool too. Ideally, you're not breaking things. So let's talk about maybe the first steps. So uh, what is the absolute first thing that has to be in place for someone to increase that velocity of, of code deployments or of um, iteration? Paper, rock, scissors. Uh, all right, I'll go. Uh, so I think one thing is uh, tests, right? So um, doesn't matter how fast you move if you're not testing. Uh, I think uh, there's a really interesting. I, I saw a talk that Jez Humble gave at the ChefConf this year, talking about um, you know how many people how, how many people run tests and and have uh, their tests fail and actually back them out. If you're not testing, there's no way to figure out uh, if they're failing and and uh, if you could release that code. And it, you can't really move very fast if you don't know what's happening. Um, so I would say for me, one of the big ones is tests. I think we're going to be good friends, Martin. This is this is good. Yeah, I, don't, I would agree. Definitely, testing is going to be your first because you can even do that locally, outside of CI/CD, right? Um, that's going to be the crucial piece, really, is making sure it runs. Yeah, being able to ensure the stability um, moving forward of of that new thing, whatever it is. Um, Another one uh, outside of it. Another one I saw in the state of DevOps report there was uh, source control, which sometimes people forget or take for granted. But um, if you can't see that your code is changing and how it's changing, it's very difficult to uh, release it or uh, test it and figure out what happened. Do you guys have lessons learned, specific um, approaches that you like to use for source control and for uh, version control around understanding the code and how it's evolved and developed? Uh, we integrate with GitHub pretty heavily in a lot of things. Um, that tends to be a good collaborative platform, especially if you're working with other companies and stuff. You can just add people in 
um, as needed to your organization and that kind of thing. Uh, that's been super helpful as far as viewing who has changed what and so on, uh, beyond just having like a basic Git platform or, or any kind of SCM uh, source control. So. Um, so one of the interesting things about the group we actually have here is that y'all are in disparate places. So you have a distributed team already. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about uh, how you've overcome those challenges by, by being in separate places but all working on similar projects and, and how GitHub or um, maybe some other tools you've found to be really valuable have helped you? Sure. Um, so I think we've got we've got a whole team of DevOps engineers in the UK. Um, we've got a couple in Australia. Uh, we've got folks in the Austin office in Texas and in San Antonio, and and people like me that are dotted all over the place, not in any particular Rackspace office. So, um, just to like reiterate what John said, I think uh, GitHub is is a great tool. Um, any test platform that everybody can see and that integrates with your source control is really great for that. Um, you know, I love that I can go um, fix something, uh, the tests run automatically, and somebody in the UK sees it while I'm still asleep and reviews it because it's come up there and they've merged it. Uh, and, and one of the other things we integrate with those two uh, that I would highly recommend is something uh, like Slack or HipChat uh, because that really is like the other pillar that closes closes the loop. Um, you, you see watch chat and you, you see the new change come in, you see the tests run, you see the reviews by real people, um, and you see the code get merged in. So it's nice to have that whole stream of events in one place as well. Yeah, that time document that you can refer back to, I feel like would have to be an invaluable component to a, a team that's distributed across time zones and, and geographies just so that you can have a single source of, uh, of truth on what's happened and have that um, running document where you can see a failed test. Okay, somebody can, can jump in there and address that or um, maybe something passed and was merged. And so uh, I think that was a component of what uh, Caleb talked about in the talk that he gave in New York as well is how much value the team has been able to derive from having Slack and the right bots in there and integrating uh, the, the testing that y'all do as well as um, you know, a new um, a new fork has been made or you know this merge has been requested and things like that. Uh, do you have specific recommendations around testing? I know you've said that a few times and I, it's near and dear to my heart. So um, what sorts of testing uh, tools and suites have you used? Um, do you have preferences, lessons learned there. Uh, let's see. I think our team has uses almost everything. Um, so we've got Jenkins. Jenkins is the old uh, sort of old standard that everybody everybody goes to. Uh, it, it's tricky when you have you kind of have to assess what tolerance you have for putting data out in the world versus keeping it in house, I think. I think there's a big uh, sort of security question there, but um, if if it's something where you have enough test data that you don't necessarily have to run it in-house, not running another service uh, um, uh, amongst your team is, is nice too. So, you know, we we also take advantage of Circle CI and Travis, um, and, and we even do uh, some collaborative things where we maintain, uh, say, community cookbooks for Chef or playbooks for Ansible, and, Sometimes those are in another um, another CI system because whoever created that cookbook or playbook or what have you plugged it in there, and, and we're just maintainers. So we really use a lot of different tools there. Um, and I would say that just finding what works best for you, the, the fewer barriers you can put in front of things, uh, the faster you can do continuous integration and delivery. If something's not working, It'll it'll kill that pipeline. <laughs> you go into some of the the pros and cons. So I know Jenkins is the one that most people have heard of or used, but uh, Travis and uh, you mentioned Circle C, I believe, CI. Um, yeah. Three, um, three of them. So could you talk through maybe uh, the pros and cons of each and what might uh, 
make that decision easier for someone who's uh, just adopting a new testing platform for the first time? Yes, uh, I think there's there's a few big things to consider. Um, as, as I said, where your data lives is a big one. Um, some of the CI platforms are happy to actually run your tests for you if it's an open source project, which is really, really amazing. So you don't even have to pay them, and they're going to run it for you. Um, so it's you know free compute for your testing, which is which is great. Um, I, I see it as almost altruistic. It makes the world a better place. Um, so, uh, but also secrets management is a big one. Um, depending on where you're keeping your secrets, uh, you may be more or less comfortable giving your um, cloud API key to your own Jenkins server versus putting it off uh, on a third-party service that you're not even paying for. Uh, so that secrets management is a big one. Um, and integration, I think, is, is if I had to pick three, those would be the three. Integration with tools like GitHub, um, integration with tools like Slack. I mean, I feel like we're at a heyday where so many of these tools integrate uh, in so many nice ways that we've never really had before on the internet, where it's, you know, add GitHub to this. You just click a button, and I, I add GitHub to things like all day long, other tools. So um, th those would be my three. Uh, I'm sure John has a different, has di maybe some different picks. <laughs> No, I agree with those, but um, I think the big one is whether you have the staff to do it on site with Jenkins or you need to kind of outsource that to something like CircleCI or Travis, at least in the short term, like if you have a really small team. I mean, I know people who spend a ton of time maintaining Jenkins at that point, so sometimes those third-party services can be beneficial, similar to like how GitHub is, is that you don't have somebody maintaining, say, as an alternative, a GitLab instance internally, you're paying somebody to do that thing, right? Um, kind of leveraging this third-party tools for that can be very beneficial uh, as opposed to Jenkins. But Jenkins, if you need something like in-house that's private and that kind of thing, that's kind of the benefit of that. I think it's a really uh, crucial point to, to drive home again because that's a question with a lot of approaches. You know, Do I want a platform as a service that someone else handles a lot of the maintenance for me, or do I want to own it myself? Um, and owning it yourself comes with those responsibilities of maintaining it, troubleshooting issues that come up. Um, so do you have the expertise already? Do you have to build that expertise? Do you have that staffing already? Do you need to hire that staff? And um, there's definitely some other components around security like, uh, like Martin mentioned. But um, those same questions don't just come up in this testing conversation. They come up all the time with how you're architecting and building the solution. So I think that's a universal truth, and I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you. I would also just put in a plug for uh, there's other things you can host in-house if, if Jenkins feels too heavyweight. There's definitely a drone and, and some tools that take advantage of containers that are that are really starting to look great these days and, and present nice alternatives to Jenkins. So um, check, out, check out stuff like CircleCI or even drone, because running your tests in a container actually is another way to get faster. It almost presents a whole other set of, of problems that there are so many great uh, options out there that you know you have to start weighing all of your choices. So um, definitely appreciate some clarity around uh, what you should be considering. And uh, it's a good problem to have, to have a lot of choices and things that are tailored for uh, specific audiences. But um, with those additional options, that definitely pushes the conversation of should we do this or should we do that um, pushes the volume up a little bit on that conversation. So um, something to consider. Well, I think this you know brings us back to this conversation that we have quite a bit. Um, you know, including it, how do you choose what you do in house versus what you bring in specialists to work on versus what you um, you know put on a platform. And this is these are the the type of business questions that you have to answer. Uh, every day in, in all of the aspects. So, you know, th there's plenty to do, um, uh, plenty to consider when you look at that. So just keep uh, trying new things and testing and figure out what works best for you. And, you know, it always goes back to testing, doesn't it? you got to make sure that you... Uh, it does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Well, hey, let's take this uh, real quick break and, and kind of just mention that anybody that just started to watch, uh, we are uh, live on our Rackspace Office Hours Hangout. Um, we are talking about CI/CD, and we've uh, got a couple of, uh, of guests with us today, uh, John and Martin from the uh, Rackspace, one of the DevOps teams here. They're both engineers. 
Um, we also wanted to hear from you if you have any questions. Uh, you can hit us up on Twitter with the hashtag CloudQA. You can also uh, use the Q&A app here uh, on Google+. And speaking of which, we do have one, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting that one up there. Uh, let's see. Um, are DevOps services only for customers that have a large budget? Is there a cost-friendly way uh, for customers to implement DevOps practices? Uh, let's see here. Uh, so I think uh, you know, it's an interesting space right now, this idea of DevOps, because you've got, uh, you actually have a lot of smaller teams seeing more benefit, I feel like, from DevOps than the enterprise. Uh, you know, there was a, I don't have the right attribution for the, for the quote, but there's a great thing about, um, you know, and the enterprise isn't interested in DevOps, but and, and that some of the DevOps communities aren't really interested in the enterprise, but to succeed, it's got to get, that DevOps has to get to the enterprise, right? So, like, it seems like it actually is, is found more of a home in sort of the startup community and small to medium-sized businesses. Um, but at least uh, for customers at Rackspace, when you ask about budgets and cost-friendly uh, ways to do it, I think the, the pricing is very competitive for it, I would say, um, you know, fixed monthly cost, and I would say that um, we've actually had a lot of really tiny one, two employee, you know, type businesses um, that we've worked with and, and done uh, sort of automation for with our DevOps automation service, and uh, it's really cool. You get to see them grow into companies with hundreds of employees, and, you know, I, I, I see them on CNN, and I'm like, that's so cool. They grew from this small team. And that was, it's such a like rewarding experience to work on customers like that. And they all started fairly small where, you know, I was on a weekly conference call with their CEO <laughs> who was also every other, who was their HR, who was their developer, who was their, all of those things. So I would say, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking it may be something you could take advantage of, um, you know, definitely worth looking into, even, even if you do it in house, I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely approachable for for a smaller business, um, not a large budget necessarily. Well, is it easier? Do you have do you have more velocity and, and more um, agility really um, at that small stage to uh, you know to, to build something using these best practices that we're talking about? I mean, it's something that if you are already have a lot of momentum, that it's going to actually take a lot more effort to to get that changed. I think that's right, although with the caveat that um, there's not a lot of huge organizations sort of adopting DevOps practices, whether it be CI or CD or, or any other type of practice that is called DevOps. Um, so it's hard to know, like, uh, when you have the sort of really, really big businesses investing in it. I mean, it sounds like they, the stats I've seen are that we'll see a lot more adoption in the next 20 years than, than we've seen hardly at all so far. So it's, it's hard to know. I think we'll have to really see some really big businesses get into it and adopt it as a practice and then see where that goes um, to really yeah, to know for sure. Yeah, I think the fear oftentimes is going to be that, you know, we've already got this thing that kind of works. And so to uproot your approach and, and change is very difficult. So the cloud native startup type community is using the ability to make changes very quickly and that agility and speed as their differentiator and as the thing that's driving their growth. And, and so it, it's easy for someone to start, you know, from scratch. Square one that tends to be how do we make that change? You know, I'm an existing organization, I'm doing it this way, and I want that value, but there's no one painting the, the path for me to go from here to there. And so I think that's a, an interesting conversation for us to have. I mean, we've had to make that shift. We weren't always uh, pushing code at the pace that we're pushing uh, code to our... our uh, John, do you have any recommendations on maybe you know step one, step two, or or what that first few um, changes would need to be for someone to begin to adopt a faster approach to uh, deploying code. I mean, in a lot of cases, the first thing I would do is make sure that you can actually 
have more of a collaborative process because I've seen where you know massive merges and that kind of stuff come in. Uh, large pull requests like do smaller, more iterative changes in your workflow, um, and have the tools to collaborate. I think is a huge one among your team. Like have Slack or HipChat, like Martin said. Um, have you know Google Hangouts something for video chat um, and open up communication among your team a lot more. Um, I think that's the, the big one. So it sounds like uh, a cultural shift is as much um, a key component to that as the tooling. And then the tooling we've talked yeah. about quite a bit. Yeah, I think it is. Um, uh, we have worked with some enterprise customers, and usually they make a small team to do this kind of thing, you know, to experiment with it and that kind of stuff. So it works well for small teams, definitely. That's a really interesting point. Um, are there specific uh, corners of the business where it seems to make more sense? Would a, maybe a marketing team be a good place to uh, begin to toy with and, and build out a DevOps CI CD approach? Uh, maybe business intelligence or something like that? Or does it not really matter? Just find a corner where you can um, get a few people together and start making progress. Yeah, um, a lot of what I've seen is just basically they have a small project they want to experiment with or something like that. They don't have a lot of people on it yet, um, and they're just starting out with it. Um, a lot of times they're starting from scratch in those cases. Well, um, I, I think, think it'd be a lot harder. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think that's a great uh, place to start, right? I mean, you, if you already have established processes that are working for you, you, you might want to change them to something that's going to be more efficient down the road, but before you do that, go ahead and, and try a side project on that or, or a project that's starting from scratch so you don't have any technical debt, so you don't have any cultural debt that you need to take care of as well. So I think it's a great way to start. We often see uh, like a website here, a third, like a small product launch that's unrelated maybe to their core business or something like that where, you know, small team just launching this website, just want to get some amount of code deploys out per day, and, and that's a really good fit, I think. And we're very upfront with, with uh, people when we talk to them about sort of going down that path that, that you know, it's not, it takes some work. It's not necessarily like you're going you're gonna to do your one-off side project and it's going to be great and then everyone's going to be convinced and, and your whole organization is going to, you know, transform overnight. We definitely tell people like it doesn't necessarily always make things faster to run tests, right? If you if you deploy without testing, then yes, testing is going to be a little slower than that. Um, it doesn't always mean that, you know, there's a lot of things that you'll have to, that might not necessarily look great at first that end up in the long run benefiting you. Um, more successful changes deployed, but you might end up shooting down a lot more changes because you've actually tested them and found out they're not successful changes. Um, so we definitely have that conversation with people too that, you know, you have to be in it for the right reasons. It's not, you're not going to, you know, hop on hop on and say, you know, buy, buy DevOps and now I've bought DevOps, I've got DevOps. Like it's, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't come in a box? Not that I know of. Well, no. Is there a theme, like a specific light bulb that typically comes on first uh, where you know someone has adopted this for this one little project? What's usually the, the aha moment where, you know, I think there really is value here. We were able to clear this first hurdle or I don't know. Um, what do you usually see there? What do you, Martin, actually see there? Uh, let's see. I see often... Um... I see people get really surprised when um, we've been going slow and steady and following the principles and and maybe it's not as fast as they want and then they um, decide that all right everything looks good let's let's scale these up and down in the cloud every day and it's like a little bit more work not much right and so it's not um, it's not this project where you've spent weeks implementing this thing and then all of a sudden you want to make a change and there's a lot of technical debt, or there's a lot of uh, rewinding and un, uh, unspooling again, and going back to the drawing board. Like I think people, that's one where I see the light bulb go on, where somebody, um, especially with things like configuration management um, or, or testing, where it's like, oh no, that's actually really easy now, 
you know, we've we've followed all the principles, and yes, we we can make this huge change in your infrastructure really easily, really successfully. Um, so that that to me is when you see those wins. Yeah, I agree with that because a lot of times it's like, well, you're managing a hundred servers or something, you make a change and restart that. If you don't have some kind of test environment that's built identically to what you have like in production, every variable you have there, different packages on the system and so on. In our case, like that's a big deal because sometimes that can make or break your your production environment. And then if if that goes down, you're down, right? So. Um, the big thing is saying like, oh yeah, this actually worked in staging, and now we're pushing it out, and that was successful across, you know, 10, 20, 100 servers, something like that is a big aha moment for people. So trust and reliability, where you know they're used to being bit by this thing they didn't expect, and they just get, you know, consistently hit by something else random, and then they start developing this approach and they start uh, getting okay at it but they quit seeing all those problems that show up repeatedly and all of a sudden it's been X number of days, weeks, releases without incident and it's like that uh, number of days since the last three uh, number has just kept climbing and one day they look up and say hey, this is not bad. Well, that's pretty yeah, sure. For sure, that's like uh, that's a huge one. I think that also uh, the idea that you know in some of these sort of cloud centric applications, there's no more maintenance windows. That's an interesting one. Um, you know, there's like John says, you may push out a change to a hundred servers, but you do you know five at a time or a percentage. It's, it it becomes a totally different model at some point from like traditional enterprise IT, um, and, and you start to see people apply it to other things too. They think. Gosh, if I could do that with my sort of DevOps managed website, maybe I can do that with my ticketing system. Maybe I can do that with uh, maybe you know they start to think, why doesn't my car get new updates every day or my phone or you know they start to see that all over the place in their world and think, gosh, if they managed it like this, I would have like new new stuff all the time. Well, one thing that we just got a comment on on Twitter from Skip. Uh, he says, "Won't that light bulb moment? Uh, me, won't that light bulb moment be when it works without self-destruction?" And and I think that you kind of hit on that just there. Um, when it starts to work uh, for others, right? And and it starts to, um, you know, for that one thing, it, you get that light bulb moment of your own. Hey, it's working on this thing really well. Uh, nothing broke. Let's let's start to move it into other aspects. And I think that's a that's a great uh, way to do it, especially as you mentioned earlier. Sometimes uh, some of these larger, more established companies are just working uh, on a small team or something uh, to start off with. Thanks, Skip. And uh, Skip, and anyone else who's watching, uh, we're happy to address questions or um, bring up your comments and fill out this conversation a little bit further. Um, I know there's all sorts that we could ha probably have a show just on testing and focus on that approach. And we could probably have a show, uh, many, many shows on config management and all these other topics that are related. But uh, trying to be uh, broad, we haven't really dug into any of these to a great degree. So if there's something we need to, to cover more deeply while we have experts on with us, please uh, let us know what those might be. And with that, uh, what, what testing strategies, I know that's a, a big part uh, but what testing strategies really make a difference between uh, having testing that's functional but not ideal and really having a robust and thorough and effective testing strategy? I love testing, so we're going to talk about it for the rest of the show if no one else um, <laughs> hijacks this. Sorry, I'm having some network flips or something here. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Um, what strategies in your testing are going to make for the best results? I mean, uh, definitely, I think one of the main strategies is if something does break that you didn't write a test for before, for whatever reason, um, is to make sure that you wrote that back into your testing for future, so like regression testing, that kind of thing. Make sure that if something happens, it's like, that breaks everything, <laughs> make sure you wrote a test for that so that if somebody commits code later on, that same thing isn't going to break. 
I think that's a huge strategy is making sure you're writing tests that make sense. I would, um, just to add on to what John said too, I would say uh, test the things that are fastest to test early. So, um, you know, what you don't want is to write some code and then have to come back in three hours for your 300 server, you know, multi-tier, six-tier crazy app to run its tests, like to find that um, you failed the style guide that you had for your language. You should have capitalized that that class name or something, right? Like you want to get the uh, get the easy tests out of the way first. So um, sometimes that looks like uh, unit tests versus functional testing. Sometimes that looks like uh, other kinds of things, uh, but like a style style checks, but whatever it is, like the sooner you give feedback on the test, I feel like the better and and the faster you can get some actionable feedback on the test, the the faster velocity you can move at. That, that's a great piece of advice. Um, making sure that you use or you start those quickly failable tests first, I guess you know, so you don't like you said, you don't wait three hours and say, oh hey, you know this thing. Failed. Let's go through it again and see what happens. So that's really good, solid advice that people can follow. That's kind of extending the same approach that you have by having smaller pieces of, of code and smaller changes being deployed into production. If you're taking smaller steps and having those easily tripped, um, easily tested components tested early, that's going to increase your velocity just by the sheer fact that you know it immediately and you can stop your test, roll back, make the change, and move forward again. Um, so that small piece uh, approach of we're just making this one little change and we're going to run it through our battery of tests and put it into production, um, taking that same approach uh, in testing, I hadn't thought of, of that approach, but that's fantastic because that same, uh, same theme and same approach is applicable in a lot of places. So I think there's probably many more I haven't thought of that we'll run into. When really you can just look at sort of what software developers have known for a while now. I mean, a big theme of DevOps is infrastructure as code. So in a lot of ways, there's a lot of prior art we can look back to. And, and you know, the Agile movement, they know we should be writing tests. They've, they've figured out that that's really valuable to the, to the business. Um, and, and things like that uh, state of DevOps report for 2014 even came out and said that, that the data they collected showed that infrastructure, that code, was actually a better predictor of success than even the, the software itself, uh, the quality of that code. So, so we're building on the shoulders of a lot of uh, people here, too. So I think it, it's nice to be able to look back and say, uh, this has been happening for a while. How can we apply it and learn those, not have to learn those lessons the hard way? Or over again, if someone's already uh, learned that lesson and can share it with the rest of the community. And that's really a, a value of things like this, where we're just discussing a specific topic. Someone who maybe hasn't uh, run into that specific hurdle gets to hear from somebody who has run into that hurdle, and they get to escape it all together. And so that's, and that's where we are now in, uh, in technology, and we'll continue to, to build on the shoulders of other people's work, and that's the beauty of open source approaches and, and a lot of what we're talking about. But um, I'm happy to be sharing these lessons learned with uh, a larger audience and making sure that um, more and more gets built uh, well and quickly and in the hands of users so that we can all benefit from somebody's bright idea. Yep. All good stuff there. Uh, that's definitely one of our uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say core values, but one, one thing that we do tend to go along with a lot is uh, making sure that we contribute, you know, um, beyond just ourselves. And I know that a lot of the uh, cookbooks you work with, you're contributing upstream, and uh, it kind of goes along with that same uh, philosophy. Good to see that. Yeah, definitely opting for, if you can pull something in from the community that they've already done, and, and it already has tests written for it in a lot of cases, right? Right. Um, so if you can use something that is maintained by a group of people and they may run into an issue before you will, maybe they're on a larger scale, larger company, that kind of thing, well, we hit this networking issue or something like that with this, and then that gets pushed upstream. I think that is a big benefit to doing that. 
if you uh, really want to make friends in the community, go find something that doesn't have tests and write them. Uh, you make lots of friends. Well, how, how would you get into that? How would you go about finding something that doesn't have a uh, test written and, and get that written? Uh, to use the to use the chef cookbook example, I think you'll find that um, they've actually got uh, lists of adoptable cookbooks. That's a popular one. Um, I also just even going and looking at what the most popular cookbooks are, um, I think is one way to find uh, the you know the community moves it in in bursts and and then this slow sometimes. So there's certainly really popular software out there that still doesn't have tests. If, Go look at the most popular thing and you know, write a test for it. If you, if you can't find anything, I have lots of projects I contribute to. Just, just send me an email and I will steer you to some that I need tests for, <laughs> selfishly. Uh, but, but seriously, yeah, there's lots of um, there's lots of big pieces of software that where you know we've used like Chef Cookbooks where we've used them and and the thing we end up contributing back is a test to show that something that was broken for one of our customers at Rackspace, and you'd think, all right, now everybody benefits from checking whether that uh, is broken in the future with new changes. So uh, so that, that's a really cool thing, and, and I, it's not too hard to find software that needs more tests. I don't, I don't think a lot of people would identify their software as done, uh, <laughs> tests or otherwise. Well, that's definitely the more popular the the software you're testing, the more friends you'll make. So it depends on if you want to maintain your anonymity or if you want to get um, a lot of a lot of visibility. That's both good to keep in mind. Uh, so timing of building tests and the way you build your tests. We've talked a little bit about what, uh, what you ought to be doing when you discover maybe something has failed when you put it into production, uh, incorporating that back into your testing. But when you're building something, um, what's your timing on how you how you build those tests and how do you code against uh, your needs? Well, I mean, it's supposed to be test driven. It's like typically how people go nowadays, right? So, in an ideal world, I think you would write your test first and then you would write the code to pass that test, right? That's like the whole theory behind that. In practice, it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, sometimes you get a little ahead of yourself adding features and stuff like that, but I think just as soon as you notice, like, you added something and you didn't make this work, like, write something for it quickly um, before you end up with a pile of stuff that's completely not developed in a way that you can even test against it in some cases, in some languages, that's possible, you know, you can't unit test against a giant chunk of code at the time. So I think making sure you're, you're, as you iterate on that, you keep tests updated for it. So I just... I wanted that to be said out loud because it's just like flossing. Like every every dentist always says, you ought to be flossing, and you know everybody needs that reminder again and again and again to actually floss. But um, that's fantastic advice that I don't feel like the the majority of um, developers use, or, or they'll um, have to be reminded of it um, as they're going. And so this is going to serve as another reminder: write the test code to pass the test. Test comes first. We um we also haven't mentioned it yet, but regression testing. Uh, don't don't forget when you're you're not done necessarily when your bug report comes in. That's another great opportunity to write a test. Um, I know some people just do that automatically. But the other thing we're saying out loud is, uh, you can write tests long after you've shipped a version of your software because you don't want to break that feature over and over again for your users, whether that software be infrastructure or um, actual application software. You do, you want to make sure you never see that bug again. Well, yeah, that's super frustrating as a user when you um, when you see a bug, you report a bug, it, it happens, it gets fixed, uh, and then the company pushes another update, and that same bug pops pops up. And you know, I mean, sometimes it, it happens for a completely different reason. You know, it might just have the same symptom to the end user, but if it's if it's the same bug, that's just that's preventable. Absolutely. So we've got about uh, 10 minutes left in the hour, and we don't have to take the entire 10 minutes of the hour, but are there specific uh, lessons learned or, or little nuggets of wisdom uh, that the two of you would like to share with uh, the broader audience about um, things that may not get uh, addressed and highlighted 
typically that you feel like are really important and would be valuable to keep in mind? Uh, I'll share. I'll share one, and then um, and then let John take a turn. But uh, I think one that I often re relearn. It's like the hot stove I keep touching. So so maybe this won't help you because you're going to do it just like me over and over again. Um, but every time I think uh, when I'm doing continuous integration and uh, new code comes in and I review it and it looks good and the test pass and then um, uh, the there's one more change that needs to be made and I think. Well, that's not going to break the uh, build. That's that's documentation, or that's not going to break X or or Y or um, you know. I mean, I've touched that stove so many times that that I if someone asked me to merge something, they say, well, that won't break it. I don't care. I'm not merging. I'm not even putting that code anywhere near the trunk until it passes again. Because uh, I I feel like that's when you get into that discipline where you're really testing things every time um, and and, and by the way, people that aren't you might be adding tests, so you don't know what's going to break it necessarily. And um, and and that can even be upstream, right? CentOS can release a new version of their distribution. Ubuntu can release a new version of their distribution. It may not even be your change, but there's just you should just never assume that that test is going to pass and put code in there uh, into into your trunk uh, without letting those tests run again, um, and maybe even just running them nightly even without changes because that's a great way to know about something before your users do. Um, that, would, that would be one of mine. Sounds like some earned wisdom there. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, John, yeah. do you have any uh, nuggets of wisdom to share as we close? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, regular testing, especially if you're developing on, like, say, in Python, and you're using different fit modules and that kind of thing, um, making sure that you're still compatible and that something just didn't break upstream because, you know, in the open source community, you're depending on a lot of things, Ruby gems and Ruby um, chef cookbooks and chef and stuff. Uh, even the chef version sometimes, you know, they'll release a new version. You, know, you need to make sure it works with that. So, like, even doing, like, a nightly build or something would be good to make sure your, your code's actually running and still working. Or you might, I mean, two days later, change something, and then your change didn't actually break it. It was something that changed upstream two days ago, right? and then you have to track that down. Well, something I know that we do with our orchestration um, solution, if you're wanting to build you know, a WordPress deployment with tiered and, and structured architecturally the way we recommend it, you can make a few selections and click go, and we'll build it for you. Those tools are just built regularly because we know that there are all of those components that are part of that build that uh, we don't own. So, you know, there's there's a cookbook that's upstream that we pull down that has dependencies that are open source that are being changed from time to time. So we're always building those, you know, all the time. And when there's a problem, there's an alarm that goes off and we go in and identify that problem, we fix the problem, and then we release it back out into the wild through the tests. And um, when it's clear, then you can build those again successfully. But we're always building those solutions just because we know that there's so many contingencies out there that can change without our interaction that we need to verify it's always going to work. And as soon as we know it doesn't, we can take action. So that's not even, um, you know, I've made this change, so I want to verify that change didn't uh, impact something. We know that those sort of, uh, of tools and offer rings or else outside of um, outside of our control that it requires that regular testing and, and so that's that's fantastic advice uh, when you know you're relying on something outside of your control just a regular uh, repeated test can be a huge value uh, so you don't get caught off guard by something that didn't quite come out the way you expected or wanted or your users need yeah, and even to build on that a little further in the couple of minutes we have left, I think another thing to remember is that just because you're testing against upstream uh, dependencies that you maybe haven't pinned down, um, at the same time, it's it's very important that for the systems that need to be production and need to uh, be working regardless of upstream changing, um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't lock the dependencies down on those versions, right? It doesn't mean you should upgrade all your libraries every night uh, in production after they pass tests. 
It just means you know that the latest versions may or may not break it, but at the same time, it's it's critical to not not necessarily adopt that as a, a continuous delivery strategy either. Um, protect yourself by pinning the versions, and then learn from upstream um, and be informed so that so that when you do make decisions about new versions of dependencies, you have all of the info in front of you. Very good stuff. Well, I don't have anything else to share. I know that we could go deeper into any of these topics, but um, I think that covers at least a good idea of how to get started. And, it's a good and groundwork. Why. Yeah, absolutely. So a good foundation has been laid. Um, as always, if you're a Rackspace customer, you have access to right people who have all sorts of expertises. So don't try to go it alone. You've got resources you can lean on, you can uh, make requests to and get uh, feedback from. So call us, let us know how we can help. But if you're not a Rackspace customer, um, there's so many resources out there you can use to, um, to learn and improve your approach. So um, be aware of what tools are out there and start uh, weighing some against each other and, and deciding how to move forward because there's a lot of value in understanding how to make more consistent and quick changes to your code and to your environments so that you can get the most value um, out of your development team, out of your, um, your business, and um, it's just a huge value. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Martin and John for uh, jumping in and helping us out and being the experts here. Thank you for having us. We're happy to have you. We would have been able to uh, stumble around this topic for a while but not get in to you. Uh, we're, we're very thankful. Um, but I think that's all we've got for today. I think we're going to have another show next week, same time. So join us for that, and we will uh, see you around. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.